From the outside, the house looks just like any other on the block in the New York neighborhood. Step inside, and you'll see something strange, a wall. Now, you would expect walls on the inside of a house to separate kitchen, dining room, living room, but this wall is different. This wall divides the entire house from top to bottom. You see, Simon and Shana Taub could only agree on one thing during their divorce proceedings. They both want the house. So much so that the court decided that they had to build a wall through the living room. Now, if Simon wants to get to his dining room, he has to go outside, up a neighbor's stairs, across a balcony, and through a window just to get in. Shana, for her part, complains how Simon is yelling on his side of the wall, banging against the wall, and turning down the heat when it's cold. They both have vowed and resolved that neither of them is going to move out before the other one. And so you can see that a house divided against itself can stand. It's just that the occupants inside can't stand each other. Relationships make life worth living. But when walls go up and we can't communicate, then we discover that we're at a standstill or a standoff. We might tear the fabric of our relationships. Perhaps you're in a relationship right now that you can think about that's sort of stretched or strained, or maybe it's snagged or scratched, scarred, severed. You wonder, how can I possibly heal it? This series, MEND, is going to be about how we can make relationships healthy again. We're going to look at Proverbs, the book of wisdom that God gives to us, and how it can show us and teach us the ways in which we can make our relationships healthy again. I'm waiting for it to come up. <laughs> there you go. Proverbs says this, Blessed are those who find wisdom, those who gain understanding. For she, wisdom, is more profitable than silver and yields better returns than gold. Her ways are pleasant ways, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who take hold of her. Those who hold fast will be blessed. You see, what the scriptures say is that God's wisdom, used in our relationships will give us pathways that are pleasant and peaceful. They will give us life and blessedness. They will show us how we can mend and heal and restore the ripped and torn fabric of our relationships. Now, you might think people in the Bible, of course, Bible heroes, they apply God's wisdom in their relationships. They never have relationships that are torn or frayed or shredded, but that's not the case. Consider, for example, the patriarch Joseph. W with arthritic hands, aged hands, he holds the garment that is slashed and bloodied. His aged eyes begin to tear up as he clutches the multicolored, beautiful robe now torn to shreds. It was a, a gift he once gave to his 17-year-old son, Joseph. And when he looks at that torn fabric, he realizes that he must have been torn to pieces by wild animals. He says, some ferocious animal has devoured him. Joseph has been torn to pieces. Little does Jacob realize that the wild animals who abuse his son stand around him. It's the other ten sons in his family who did this. Let me give you a little background. Let's go back a bit. Jacob is the son of Isaac, who's the son of Abraham. He is uh, one of the patriarchs, father over 12 sons and at least one daughter. His story is found in Genesis, first book of the Bible. But it's a story that shows that in his family circle, there are things like envy and jealousy, 
favoritism, resentment, neglect, abuse, all the kinds of things we still see in families and relationships today. Now, quite often, as is the case today, the children and their sins come from the sins of the parents. Let's look at Jacob for a minute. He's kind of a wildly deceptive con artist, and he goes by two names in the Bible, two rather unflattering names. One is Jacob, which means supplanter. In other words, he, he sort of deceptively, cleverly steals the position, the place of somebody else. He takes somebody else's place. And the other one is Israel. That's his other alias, which means one who wrestles with God. Do you get the picture here? This so-called Bible hero is somebody who gives everybody, including God, a run for their money. But Jacob has his own trials and problems within his family. He's the father over at least 13 children by four different wives. You know, some of you tell me that being in a blended family is sometimes like being in a blender. So many things going on, competition, jealousy, anger. Imagine how that's magnified in Jacob's family. All that living under one roof or actually probably one tent. And it goes on and on, and he tries to get them to get along. And you can see why God doesn't like polygamy, why he's against it, because of all the stuff going on in Jacob's family. What's more, Jacob makes it worse by favoring the children of one of his wives, Rachel's children, Joseph and Benjamin. He favors them. And the others can sense it. And they start to seethe over it. And then when Rachel dies, he favors them even more. He loves them even more. And as his love for, say, Joseph increases, so does the anger of his brothers. When his brothers saw that their father loved Joseph more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. And they really get angry when Jacob robes Joseph in a multicolored, finely woven, regal robe it's a suit suitable for a prince. And it's not lost on the other brothers what Jacob is saying, what he's signifying by this robe. He's basically saying that I'm appointing Joseph to be my heir and your master. So the stage is set for Joseph's downfall. And the last straw are the dreams that Joseph has, and he foolishly tells his dreams to his brothers. He says, listen to this dream, Joseph says, I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose up and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. His brother said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. So one day, Joseph is coming to them all by himself in his regal robes, and the brothers plot to kill him. As he approaches, they gather around him like a pack of wild wolves. They tear off his prince suit and throw him down in a well, planning to kill him. They put a rock over the top of it to keep him there. Sometime later, the darkness opens up, the light pours in as they remove the rock, and rough hands reach down, grab hold of it, and pull him up. But instead of killing him, they decide, they resolve to just bind his wrists and cords and lead him away. They sell him to a passing Bedouin caravan so that he'll be a slave in Egypt. And as Joseph is being led away on foot to become a slave down in Egypt, he takes one backward glance and looks and sees his brothers laughing and dividing the few coins they got for selling him as a slave. Now there's just one more thing to do, and it's the cover-up. And the boys have learned well from their father how to be deceptive. They take the robe, which they still have, they slash it, cut it, and cover it with blood from a goat. And then they hand it over to their father. And as their father dissolves into grief and sadness, clutching the torn robe of his son, 
Suddenly, I think the boys realized just what they had done. The torn fabric of that robe is the symbol of the torn fabric of this family. Now, their story is extreme. It probably isn't going to ever happen like that for you, but still, many of the things we see in this story happen with our own relationships in some way. So I want you to think about a relationship in your life right now, one that might be a little tense or tattered or torn. Can you see the person's face? Can you picture the situation? The question is, in this relationship, do I want to defend, end, or mend? You see, many of us, when we get into arguments, want to defend, defend ourselves, our position, where we're right and the other person is wrong. We, we want to list all the things that they did wrong. And in the story of Jacob, Joseph, the family, you can see there's a lot of wrong going on. They all have a part in why things got to be the way they are. Look at Jacob, for example. He is kind of a little deceptive, but he also is favoring children one over another. And the kids sense that. Kids know that kind of thing. He also seems to be very passive and uninvolved in what's going on and lets this stuff happen. Then there's Joseph, bragging, boasting, wearing his fancy robe, telling about his dreams, usually probably coming out of a low self-image, trying to build his own image up among his older brothers. And that kind of behavior only winds up with a trip down into a pit and eventually down into slavery. Or what about the brothers, seething with resentment, anger, hostility, resentment that's boiling will sometimes boil over into actions you later regret. Or buried anger can be like a landmine, ready to go off at any time. All these kinds of things can go on, and we're very good at seeing where the other person is wrong. As a matter of fact, maybe if you've ever noticed sometimes, if you're ever like me, you know, it's easy to start to rehearse like you're in court all the wrong the other person did, like you're an attorney presenting your case, and you're trying to show how the other person is wrong. That kind of thinking, that kind of defensive behavior builds walls and creates standoffs. Proverbs says, whoever loves a quarrel loves sin. Whoever builds a high gate invites destruction. So while you're doing that, it's quite likely that your opponent is doing the same thing. It says in Proverbs 18, a brother wronged is more unyielding than a fortified city. Disputes are like the barred gates of a citadel. You see all those walls going up and preventing anything from happening or any mending from occurring. Now, you might think, I've had it. You know, I, I, I've tried. It's not going to work. And so you just instead want to end the relationship. You want nothing to do with this person. You don't want to talk to them. You don't want to see them. You want to divorce them. You want to separate from them. Perhaps you, you just wish they were dead. A couple weeks ago, I told you about my great-grandfather, Haig Simsarian. Uh, as a boy, he escaped the Armenian genocide, came here to America. Uh, he became a great man. You know, today is his birthday. Uh, if he were alive today, he'd be 142 years old. Now, he became a great man, as you can see from this newspaper article, but he was also kind of like Jacob. His wife died young, leaving him with five daughters to raise. Five daughters that he loved. He loved them, but he also loved to play them off against each other. Such that when he died at the age of 98, they weren't speaking to each other. When my grandmother, Lucy, his second daughter, died at the age of 80, she left two instructions for her funeral. The first one is that she would have a closed casket the second one is that we would not invite her other sisters to the funeral. We complied with her first request and ignored her second. Why? Because we wanted the fighting to stop and the healing to begin. God asks us, instead of defending 
where we're right or ending a relationship. He wants us to mend. He says in Proverbs, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. See, what God's word says is that in my mind, I'm always right. But instead of leaning on my own understanding and limited, biased perspective, maybe I should check out what God's is. Remember how I said a few minutes ago, sometimes you might catch yourself like you're arguing your case in court and where the other person is wrong? Well, when that happens, when you see yourself, catch yourself doing that, pause and look, instead of at the other person, at the bench. Because at the bench sits a judge, the Lord, who judges motives on both people's hearts. Ask him to give you his perspective on the situation. Because mend starts with me. That's the way to begin. Begin by looking within. As Proverbs says, all a person's ways seem pure to them, but motives are weighed by the Lord. So when you go before the Lord with this situation in prayer, maybe ask yourself these questions. What did I do or say to stretch or sever the relationship? What's my part? What ignited my anger? And how can I respond differently? Where am I being selfish? What do I fear I will lose? A possession, a position, my power, my pride? Why do I keep falling into this unhealthy pattern with this person? These are just a few questions to get started. There are others, but the place to begin is with me. And as you go through this, ask God to guide you and see the situation from his point of view. How might the situation go differently? What is my part in it? What might God want me to do that helps and heals? Do you know that uh, Joseph survived slavery? He got down into Egypt. He went through a lot more troubling times. Unjust accusations, an unfair jail sentence. But eventually, through all of that, in spite of all of that, with God's help, he kept rising until he became, of all things, prime minister of the entire country of Egypt. Well, now his brothers came down there thinking he was dead. They didn't recognize him when they begged for food. They got down on their knees and begged for him to feed them. And when Joseph, who did recognize the brothers, saw them, suddenly he remembered his old dream about how they would come and bow down to him. Now, in that moment, what could he do? He could crush them. He could wreak revenge on them. He could sell them into slavery. But he doesn't. Instead, he forgives them. And the brothers are grateful for that, but they know it might only be while their dad is still alive. And so they resolve and decide to do a little trick. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, ah, oh, what if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs we did to him? So what do they do? They try one more deception. They say, oh, your dad told us this. Our father told us this. They go to him and they said, this is what you are to say to Joseph. I, I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. He didn't say that, but they used the story. Now, please forgive the sons of the servants of the God of your father. And what does Joseph do at that moment? Does he tear up the relationship? No. He tears up. He weeps. And he forgives. Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them 
and spoke kindly to them. Joseph could have looked at his own anger, rage, and revenge, but instead he lifted his eyes above himself to see God's greater plan for keeping his whole family alive. And not only that, but through this one family, God would bring forward the Savior of the world who would mend all our relationships as well. They said that even before their two-week honeymoon was over, even before their honeymoon was over, they found themselves in what they called marriage hell. They said, we knew our relationship was in serious trouble. We had been warned about five areas of potential conflict, and we immediately jumped into all five of them, sex, communication, money, children, and in-laws. Then we argued about our arguments and began to layer resentment on top of resentment. It was a perfect setup for misery and disenchantment. And that was all before they finished the honeymoon. Now, you might expect this from many different couples, but you might be surprised to hear that this is the story of Rick and Kay Warren. People who are known to be Christians and who follow God's word and teach other people to have good marriages and relationships. Yet, that was not the case for them. They had to struggle and work hard at it. Kay says this, I don't approach this subject from the Hallmark card version of marriage, but from the blood, sweat, and tears of the trenches where our marriage was forged and is sustained. Now she talks about what she does to help the relationship be better. I know what it's like to choose to build our relationship to seek marriage counseling again and again, to allow our small group and our family into the struggle, to determine one more time to say, let's start over, and please forgive me, I was wrong, and I forgive you. I know what it's like to admit that my way isn't the only way to see the world, and to try to imagine what it's like to be on the other side of me to choose to focus on what is good and right and honorable in my husband instead of what drives me crazy, to turn attraction to another man into attraction to my husband. I know what it's like to be cracked open by catastrophic grief as when their son committed suicide and to share it with your spouse when you're so different. It's hard work for all of us. And it was hard work for Kay and Rick Warren. And they did the hard work, and they still do. And that's why they say it's been the very best thing that's ever happened to either of us. We wouldn't be who we are today without each other. Don't build walls. Mend begins with me. Let's pray. I would ask you now to pray for the person or persons who came to mind. Pray for the Lord to show you your part, what you can do, and steps you can take. Do that now. We thank you, Lord, that you are the the healer of hearts and the mender of souls, please show us by your grace and power, your love and forgiveness, how we can be people like Joseph who look beyond our own hurt to see how we can mend and bring wholeness and healing in the relationships around us. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.